Jose Cortez Jr. alongside his Jose Cortez Roger Hernandez, a devoted husband and father of four, currently holds the role of Ministerial and Evangelism Director at the Southern Union Conference. With over three decades in ministry, Roger captivates audiences with inspiring talks on leadership, evangelism, and diversity. As a prolific author with over 30 books, including Helpful Truth in 2023, he enjoys reading, writing, mentoring, and sports. Roger's family comprises his wife, Kathy, four children, and two granddaughters. We're glad to have him here with us at Evangelism Impact. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Just uh, greet the person next to you and tell them, hey, thank you for showing up in the afternoon after the big Mexican lunch. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to connect with you and with others. Help us to help people to clear the confusion in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with a Bible passage found in the book of Matthew chapter 16. The Bible says, and Jesus came to the region of Caesarea and Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Straightforward question. Clear. Should have been just one answer. But they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. The operating word here in this passage is confusion. We think that confusion is a modern phenomenon. People are confused about everything. They're confused and they have lots of questions. But this confusion is as old as time itself. And people in Jesus' time, even when he was present, was confused. So I'm going to try to break down in a very practical way what Jose was preaching this morning how do you do it? How do you embrace? How do you help people who are confused? And I think there's three things that you can do. They all uh, start with the same letter because pastors love alliteration, right? But I just want to start with a foundational statement. I adapted this from a statement that I read, and I believe it's true. Um, would you read it with me? Adventism what? Do you believe this to be true? Yes or no? Say amen, make a noise, slap the person next to you. Do you believe this to be true? Yes or no? Aha. Uh -huh. Has Adventism made your life better? If this is true, why don't you share it? Do you know that 5% of people that are in your pews will go to their grave ever having brought one person to Jesus? If this, if this is true, if this is a true statement, this is a true statement in our family, because my grandmother used to be possessed by spirits and, you know, voodoo, and, and Jesus came into our family and my grandparents uh, were converted and my dad became a pastor and and now I'm a pastor and my daughter's a pastor so I see the generational impact of following Jesus I I have seen what following Jesus does so if this is true and we live in a confused world how do we get close to people how do we like Jesus connect with the Samaritan women woman I think there's three things. Number one, you have to be curious. They all start with C, by the way. Curious. Curious. Are you a curious person? Somebody said that curiosity killed the cat. Well, the cat deserved to, deserved to die because cats, <laughs> cats are not going to heaven. You understand this, right? If you show up in heaven, there's cats there. You're not in heaven, right? <laughs> you have to. When's the last time you changed your mind about something? 
When's the last time you read a book about a subject you've never read before? So if we're going to get close to people and embrace people who are far from God and are confused, I think it, start, it starts with curiosity. See, evangelism used to look like this. I'm right. You're wrong. Sit down. Let me tell you all the ways you're wrong. Now, evangelism starts not by me telling you how wrong you are, but by, by me listening and finding out what your fears, ideas, thoughts are so I can better answer the questions, existential questions that you have. I love this concept because this is what Jesus used. How many questions did Jesus ask in the New Testament? You ever thought about? In the whole Bible, is over 2,300 questions. How many questions did Jesus ask? If there's anybody in the world who could make statements instead of questions, was Jesus. Because he knew what was in the heart of people. He knew exactly what they were going through. He knew what to say. But he didn't lead with statements he led with questions can we can we uh just verbalize a couple of the questions that jesus had uh what did he say to the paralytic do you want to be healed what did he say to the woman he was preaching about it's your husband Where are the people who accuse you? He's always starting with questions. Who do people say that I am? Questions are an incredible ally for you to get into the mind of somebody who is far from God. And find out because all non-Christians are not made equal. Not everybody that doesn't go to church is mad at the church. Or was hurt by the church. Some were just bored by the church. For some, they just moved to a different location. You know that the highest degree of people who've disconnected from church since 2000 are people who just stopped coming to church because they moved locations. They're not mad at you. They don't hate God. They don't. So if you think that everybody that doesn't go to church is mad at the church, has been hurt by the church, that's only 12%. So I have to lead with questions. I love the statement by... Michael Stainer, you have to stay curious longer, and you have to avoid the advice monster. We love giving advice, right? We love it. If you're a father here, or a mother, or a grandparent, we get in that mode. I know. Right? You did? <laughs> you get, yes. Uh, you, you, uh, if I was you, you has ever heard a statement, if I was you... If I was in your place, well, you're not in my place. You don't, you don't understand. Man, I remember when I had kids, I did, well, your kids is not my kids because my kids are different than your kids. So I have to find out what's going on with you. I have to ask you questions. I have to get into your mind. I had conversations with this young man, and he said, Pastor, I don't think that smoking weed is wrong. Nothing wrong with weed. And I'm like, okay, because weed is from the earth. <laughs> and if God did not want us to smoke weed, why did he put it on the earth? And I learned that when people make dumb statements like that, my advice monster is, that's the, craziest thing I've ever heard. What, what in the world are you saying? Do you know all the... I just go here. That's my go-to. I use it in airplanes. I use it with young people. I use it with my wife. I remember my, my wife one day came home crying because her uh, you know, she was working in, in, uh, in, in for a realtor. Um, they, you know, she was yelled at and she was crying because of what happened with her boss because her boss took credit for the good things but blamed her for every bad thing. You ever had a boss like that? Insecure bosses take credit for everybody's successes 
but they never assign blame to themselves. So she was crying, and she's like crying, came home and said, this is, look what happened to me, and she's crying. And instead of me going to these questions, you know what I said to her? Quit your job. <laughs> she said, I don't want to quit my job. I'm not a quitter. I just wanted somebody to hear me. This is for the married people in the audience. Sometimes you think your wife wants your advice. And all she wants is your affirmation. But I learned these two, I learned these two questions. Every time somebody says something that completely diametrically opposed to the worldview that I have of scripture, and they say, well, I don't think this, and I, there's nothing wrong with that, and it's fine to identify uh, as a beanbag, and, and whatever it is that they say, Instead of just saying, oh, that's wrong and that's anti-biblical, you know, God frowns on that, I, I lead with interesting. Tell me more. I do it with my kids. I did it with my kids who were teenagers. You know, teenagers come up with all kinds of ideas, right? My, my son wanted to go in the back of wagons and trains to, throughout the whole United States. Imagine, I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for Christian education for him to be in the back of wagons like a hobo. <laughs> I thought, but instead of saying, that's the craziest thing idea that they've ever heard, Jonathan, I said, interesting, tell me more. I want to get to know what your thoughts are before I can respond. So if you want to embrace people and help people who are far from God, it doesn't start by you ratifying in their mind this caricature that they have painted by the media that we're always aggressive and we're always judgmental. Stop it with the advice monster and just listen to people. This, these three phrases are how society has shifted. We don't start with, I want to prove to you that this is true. What do we start with, everybody? What's the first phrase? I have to show that what I'm talking about is beneficial. So when I talk about the Sabbath, I don't start by proving it's the right day. I start talking about the benefits of the Sabbath and the blessing of the Sabbath. Is Sabbath a blessing, yes or no? Yes. yes. So I start with the, with the benefits. And then people start thinking like, hmm, this could be helpful to me. Because I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being, and these great things. And then, hey, guess what? It's also true. People are looking for things that will help them in their existence. See, your generation and my generation, uh, it, it was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But this generation is about anxiety, depression, addiction, and suicidal ideation. This is the issue an epidemic of loneliness. How are we, what does scripture have to say about real life issues? When somebody says, I'm depressed, and you say, well, you know, the Sabbath is the right day. How is that helping me in my depression? I, I, using this, I have seen a great amount of connection with people with that kid that just talking to me about the weed, I kept saying over and over, interesting, tell me more, interesting, tell me more, until he told me the magic question. You know what the magic question is? What are your thoughts? And then I said, oh, thank you for asking. I affirmed some of the things that he said. And then I said, but I have, my perspective is this. And then I shared my perspective. And he said, you gave me a lot to think about. Imagine, at the end of the conversation, he knew where I stood, but we still kept the relationship. Second thing is close. You wanna, you can't, you can't embrace somebody you're pointing the finger at. You can't embrace, this is what Jesus said. This is the accusation. They couldn't pin anything on Jesus' character. He's, he's not, you know, he's not going around beating people. He, you, he, you know, he doesn't have two or three women. There's nothing about his character that said unholiness. So the only thing that people could accuse him, 
accuse him of is his associations. So why does your teacher eat with such scum? What, can you mention to me your scummy friends? Who are your scummy friends? Who are people that make you uncomfortable, that you have deep relationships with? That you go over to their house, and the first thing they say is that you want a beer. I play with a, in a baseball team. That, you know, they're all non-Christians. They're all pagans. And they say, you want a, want a beer? I'm like, nope, thank you. And it's like, well, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> and I said, I'm a pastor. <gasps> Beep. <laughs> but it's interesting. It is interesting. When 9-11 happened and we went to, to a game, they're like, what, what do you think is going on? The first person they asked a question to about religion, when something was happening with one of their dads who passed away, I was the first person they came to. You know why? Because I was close. I always like to tell the story. I might have told it here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you again so you can remember it. I, my wife told me not to hug her. Don't hug me when I'm cleaning and when I'm exercising. When I'm cleaning, I need more help and less hugs. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> She said, when I'm exercising. And one day she was exercising, and she fell on her ankle, and I heard a loud pop. And I dropped to the floor where she was at, and I hugged her, and I kissed her, and I held, helped her up. And at no point during that experience did she ever say to me, haven't I told you not to hug me when I'm sweaty? At no point during that conversation did she say, haven't I made myself clear she did not resist the opportunity of me to come in and hugging her and comforting her, making sure she sat down, took her to the hospital, wheeled her around in the airports. Do you know why? Because at some point in everybody's life, you are going to hear a pop. This is it. Stay close until you hear a pop. Stay close until you hear a pop. Just because somebody rejected your spiritual conversations one year doesn't mean they're going to reject it forever because sometimes there's pops that happen and the divorce happens and the people, uh, you know, the kids get put in jail and that happens and somebody gets diagnosed with cancer. They don't know what happens. So when this life pop events happen, who are they going to talk to? I want to be close. I, would have, I could have overwhelmed my wife with literature about hugs, right? You need seven hugs, honey, a day so you can be a, a well-adjusted. Do you want to not be a well-adjusted? What kind of wife are you anyway? What kind of mother is not well-adjusted? What's wrong with you? I could have overwhelmed her with evidence that it's true, but it would not help our relationship. It was only when I stayed close and waited for the pop. Eventually, somebody's going to have a pop. What do you do? You can eat with people. You can listen to people. You can tell your story. You can bless them. You can celebrate them. And you can do good in the community. And my last, I have two minutes here in my clock. What's the first C? Curious. curious. Stay curious. Stop it with all the advice. Stay curious. Number two, close even with people who make you uncomfortable. And number three, stay Christ-centered. Yes, I'm going to ask you, are you fluent in the gospel? Yes. I know you're religious. I'm asking you, are you fluent in the gospel? Do you understand you're saved? You are saved by grace through faith plus nothing, period. Because yes. when it's cloudy with you, stormy from you to others. So I want to finish my presentation by telling you, reading you two quotes. What's cloudy in the gospel? Seven characteristics. Self-righteous in spirit. Combative in dialogue. 
us versus them in orientation, demonizing other groups, policing ideological borders, and using shame to ostracize. That's the attitude when you're not fluent in the gospel. Earth versus them does not mix together, does not connect with people. What will they say if, I'm, if I go to that birthday party and everybody there is eating cake at 3 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I want to be a kingdom person, not just a church person. Anybody can be a church member. I want to be a kingdom-minded member. Church people think about how to get the people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Church people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom people work to see the church change the world. I just have a passion at 56 years old. Me and Jose are almost the same age. <laughs> I do look better though. <laughs> I have a passion to reach every generation. If you want to be a person who embraces people, you don't have to compromise the truth to love on somebody. And you do that by being curious, staying close, and making sure you're Christ-centered. Helpful truth. We have something to share to the world. Now let's do it. Thank you very much. Richie Halverson is an international speaker, author, and director of church growth and revitalization for the Southern Union. His mission is to empower church leaders to reach souls for the kingdom. Having overcome an opioid addiction, Richie now shares hope and healing through his book, The Darkness Will Not Overcome, offering an honest and compelling perspective on his journey to recovery in Christ. Welcome back, Pastor Richie. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, Eric, good afternoon. Praise God for my friend there. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit this afternoon about making church a safe place. Who here thinks that church should be a safe place for all sinners? A safe place, but not a place that plays it safe. Okay, so we're called to be a safe place for broken people, but not a place that plays it safe. Uh, in the book Culture Code, the Culture Code, New York bestseller book, Daniel Coyle shares there are three skills that successful teams, corporations, you name it, have. These three skills are, number one, build safety, two, share vulnerability, and three, establish purpose. That every single, they looked at teams all over the place, from NBA teams to, to, to corporations. They looked at the Navy SEALs and, and even churches. And all three of them had these, and they all began with building safety. Because if people do not feel safe, they, they will not come close to you, and they will not come to your church. People need to feel like it's a safe place. So <laughs> Roger started with C's. I'm going to talk to you about some P's this afternoon. So here are the things that we need in order to make sure our church is a safe place. People practice the process. We need patience, and we need the person. First, let's talk a little bit, bit about people. Now, this seems a little bit like a no-brainer. Of course, we need people. But I actually had someone come up to me uh, at a training that I did not so long ago, and you know, she said, Pastor, I need to know about how to make my church grow and, and how we can get it going. And, 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 and I said, well, how many people are going to your church and, and your community? And she says, I'm the only one. And I started talking to her about church planting. Because churches sometimes, you know, they, they have a natural lifespan. And I'm, I'm revitalization. And I believe in doing everything we can to resurrect churches that are plateaued or dying. Amen. But there also comes a time when new churches have to be born. And so I talked to her and I said, you know, have you ever thought about a church plant? And she was so set on, on, on keeping this church open because her, her grandparents started the church. And I appreciated her commitment and her determination. But here's the thing. The church isn't the building. It's the people. And once the people leave, there is no church. We need people. Church is people business. 
It's not program business, and programs are a part of it. It's not preference. It's not about your preference. It's about loving people. Jesus says, uh, make disciples of all the nations. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. We need churches that reflect the people in our community. And the more people that we see who, who look like we look and are going through things that we are going through, the more people will find identification. And one of the most important things about making a church safe is they feel like they can identify with someone. But when people show up at the church and, 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 and we always pretend that we're perfect and, and all we ever say to others is happy Sabbath and we only say, well, I'm fine, and we don't really get to know people, we are giving something that people, real people with real problems cannot identify with. People, as Roger was sharing, have never been more isolated than before. They're starting to talk about how loneliness is one of the greatest health risks in our culture today. That loneliness, chronic loneliness, ha has been linked to, you know, is just as deadly to our bodies as is smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. That one of the greatest things to, to, to offset, I was talking to a neurologist, he said studies are finding one of the number one things that, that can prevent uh, uh, early onset Alzheimer's and dementia that they're finding in studies is community. We need to be a church of people for people who serve a person. People, the problem is that people, although they are our greatest asset, are also our greatest liability. And that's just the reality. The best thing about ministry is people. And the worst thing about ministry is people. The best thing about the church is people. And the thing that's keeping your church from growing, it's people. The, the enemy has used the church. He's used people in the church through what they say or do or sometimes what they don't say and what they don't do. And through their lack of empathy, even sometimes apathy, to get people to think that they're better off alone. But the fact is we're not. We need each other. And yes, it is people who make the church unsafe, but it is people who can make the church a vibrant place of transformation. And let's talk about practice. Creating a healthy church culture takes practice. It doesn't happen accidentally. It does not happen automatically. Notice what Coyle says from his book, Culture Code. He says that while successful cultures can look and feel like magic, the truth is they're not. Culture is a set of living principles working together towards a shared goal. It's not something you are. It's something that you do. Too often when I hear people talk about church growth, they say, well, well first we're going to get healthy and then we're going to do evangelism. But the problem with that is that is absolutely impossible because the only way we can ever become healthy is by doing evangelism. You know, how do you get good at basketball? You get good at basketball by playing basketball. We need practice. Practice. It's impossible to get healthy before doing mission because it's in practicing mission the church starts getting healthy. Man, I've known churches that spend like... Two years we're working on a mission statement. And meanwhile, people are going to Christless graves. They've not done any mission, but they're coming up with a really good mission statement. And friends, I believe in mission statements, but here's the thing. Let the mission determine the mission statement. The mission statement does not determine the mission. You can have the best mission statement in the world and, and also fail at mission. It's impossible to get healthy before doing machine because it's practice. You see, the fact is many of our members don't know how to interact with people who don't believe like we do. And so making the church a safe place means loving those that are hard to love, and that doesn't happen through theory. That happens through loving people that are radically differently than we are. And you'll notice as baptism starts happening and new people start coming into the church, it, for, it makes people practice. And yes, people are going to put their foot in their mouths. People are going to do stupid things. They're going to say certain things. And, you know, the pastor, we're going to have to go up to him sometimes and say, you know, this probably wasn't the best thing to say. And you begin this, this, this exciting energy of practicing mission. 
But over time, you see even the people there that are changing and transforming. Friends, it's easy to fill a church with a bunch of clones, but, but if we want it to reflect Christ, it takes practice. And when we baptize new people, we learn how to love new people. And not only do we teach them, that's incredibly prideful and egotistical to think that we're the only ones who have something to teach. You see, in the process of baptizing people and discipling them, not only are we teaching them, they're teaching us. And it creates a momentum of transformation. I want to tell you a quick story about the, the Dalton Community Chapel. I was pastoring in Cleveland, Tennessee, not far from Southern. And you had this Dalton Community Chapel. Every night, this church had some sort of mission happening there. It was not organized and done by the church. The church just opened up their doors for it. So one night they had AA. One night they had NA. One night they had, you know, C Celebrate Recovery, you name it. But there was no people. There was only two people that would show up on Sabbath that, to kind of go through the Sabbath school lesson. So the pastor was going into chaplaincy work, and, you know, he felt like there was something that could happen here. And so he reached out and said, hey, you know, I don't know what needs to happen, but something needs to happen. Someone gave them my name, probably because I'm a, I'm a sucker for hopeless cases. Because, you see, I was a hopeless case. And so he reaches out to me, he says, Richie, there's this, this is the situation. And so our church adopted this church. And we did a, a, a church plant. We didn't do a revitalize. We did a replant with a new identity. And so only two people. In fact, the conference had taken back over the mortgage. The church couldn't pay the mortgage. And so what did we do? We just started practicing ministry. We did evangelism. And this was in the middle of the pandemic. Now, we did it safely. We didn't do it carelessly. But we intentionally started doing evangelism. We started intentionally loving on the community. We started contacting all the former members and say, hey, we're going we're, we're gonna to plant something here in this church that you are a part of. Would you like to be a part of this? And the people who wanted to support the mission, we embraced them and empowered them. The people that came with an agenda, we said, you know what? This probably isn't going to be the right church for you. Because although uh, the church, what makes it safe is people, it's also people that can tear it down. And we wanted to create a culture of mission. So this is what we did. Evangelism, a regular cycle of evangelism, regular reaping meetings, regular community events. And, and then people started coming into the church. We started baptizing people who are radically differently than we do. People who say that public evangelism cannot reach people or the secular people, they're wrong. When evangelism is done right, it works. We had a, we had a, a, a lesbian couple that, would, that came to the church through this series of meetings. And we loved on this couple. And they were going through this process. And, and they reached out to me during the pro process of this series. Just like Roger said, I didn't have to come at them with unsolicited advice. I let the gospel do the work, and I just loved on them. And so, and, and, and so God started working in their lives, and she met with me one night. One of them said, you know what, Pastor, a long time ago, for a while now, I've been feeling like this is not God's ideal for my life. And through a process of loving them, man, they, they started to, you know, we started just loving them through that process of just, you know, you know being there with them. Not, not loving on the sin or saying, okay, no, that's right. You don't, no, no, but allowing the gospel to change them. And man, we baptized these two lovely people into the church, and God has been transforming their lives. One of them is, 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 is dating a, a, a guy right now, and it's just the, the gospel can change lives. We don't have to change them. And so through the process of practicing evangelism over and over again, man, this, this, this church has been transformed in just about three years. They've gone from having an average of two people to having an ad average of 50 people. Most of them new believers. And in fact, just a month ago, I was there and I preached. They invited me to preach for their mortgage burning. Listen to me, friends. God is good. And when we practice evangelism, it works when we work it. Next point. I'm going to go through these fast because I'm running out of time. The process. It is a process to make the church a safe place. What is your evangelism process? What is your evangelism process? What is your process of doing regular, systematic, 
Sowing, bridge events, and reaping events. What's your digital evangelism strategy? Because it's not enough just to stream your services anymore. How are you engaging with the people that are, that are, that are joining your streaming service? Because they're looking for connection and community. And you can even do that in the digital sphere. But I want to know how are you interacting and engaging with people in the digital? What is your process of serving the community? Because people do not care how much we know until they know how much we care. And every church should have compassion events where we don't try to convert people. We love on people. And I promise God will do the converting. And when you do that and you have your proclamation reaping events, people will want to come because you're going to lift Jesus up and he'll transform lives. What's your process of finding ways to make connection in your context outside of the church? What's your process of hospitality? What is your strategy for loving on people when they show up at your church? According to the Unstuck Group, guest experience is one of the key areas that sets growing healthy churches apart. What do people experience when they come to your church? You know, one of the blessings I have is traveling all over, and I'm going to tell you, Southern Union, I'm, I'm biased, but we got the best churches. But we also got some cold churches. And friends, I've visited churches where the bar was more welcoming than the church where the club was more intentional at loving on people than the church was, where, you know, and, and listen, friends, we've got to be intentional. You know, as a pastor, I would meet with my greeters quarterly. I'm going to be real. My meetings with my greeters was just as important as my regular meetings with my elders. And my elders supported me in this. They were behind it because they believed in the vision. But quarterly, I met with my greeters just for 30 minutes. We would have a meeting just like at Sabbath school time or between Sabbath school and church. And we would talk about hospitality principles and what do we do and how do we love on people. You know, how do we become more of a welcoming church than just a friendly church. We talked about principles, and we heard praise reports. We talked about how visitors don't like being singled out in front of people anymore. Please do not invite your visitors to stand in front of everyone. You know, I don't think anybody ever liked that. <laughs> well, Pastor, I don't even know who the visitors are. If you had them stand, I could sing. Go look for someone you don't recognize and say hello. It's not rocket science. We... We want to welcome visitors from generally from up front. Welcome. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here. Praise God for you. Welcome. And then one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit with people personally. When visitors came and seats were limited, we didn't just stand there and look and say, good luck. No, our deacons go into the audience, find seats for them, and actually bring them to their seats. And we don't have them go to the front of the seat the front of the church, we, we, we make seats for them in back. In fact, if you want to do just one thing to make your church a safer place, invite your members to just move up one row. Visitors like to come late and they like to leave early because they're still inspecting and seeing if this is a safe place. Let them do that. Let them know about what's going on. Welcome them. Don't smother them. Okay, we're talking about process. Leads to the fourth point. We got to have patience with people. We need to be patient with people. Baptism is just the beginning of the process. you got to give people time for the Holy Spirit to transform lives. And there ain't a single per person in this room that the Holy Spirit isn't still working on. Baptism is just the beginning. Give people a break. Man, the enemy beat them up when they got to the church. Don't you dare let the enemy use you to beat them up. To tear them off, to pick them apart, to tell them you're not good enough to be a part of this community. Don't do that. And I want to be clear, I'm never suggesting that we baptize people that, that, that don't know that they're becoming a part of the Adventist family. Who don't basic understanding of what it means to become a part of the church family. I'm just saying, when people are ready to be baptized, you got a mandate from God to baptize them ASAP. Love them. Be patient with people. Friends, it's about progress, not perfection. 
Stop waiting for the perfect program or the perfect pastor or the perfect president or the perfect timing. Just start loving and doing evangelism. Last point, person. One minute on this one. One of the greatest obstacles, listen to me, friends. One of the greatest obstacles to making church a safe place is a lack of gospel clarity. It's the exact same thing Roger said when he called it gospel fluency. Too many of our churches don't know what the gospel is. I don't know how many Adventists I've been by their deathbed and they've told me and they've just, you know, pastor, I don't know. How do I know I've been good enough? And I've said, brother, sister, heaven is not for those who are good enough. It's for people who served a God who was good enough. It's for people, listen to me, no matter how much you know the Bible, that does not save you. The people who killed Christ knew the Bible better than any of us. For years in my struggle with addiction, I knew what the right thing to do was, but I could not do it. Addiction was too powerful. I needed a Savior to step into my situation, my sickness, my sin, and pull me into salvation. But pastor, is doctrine not important? Absolutely. Just don't ever preach a doctrine with, without making Jesus the star. Because Jesus is the star, friends. You're not the star. Your preferences are not the star. Nobody cares about your political affiliation. Introduce people to Jesus because he changes lives. Thank you for letting me share. Jose Cortez Jr., alongside his cherished wife Joanne and their family of two sons, finds profound joy in ministry. With nearly 25 years of experience in church leadership, Cortez currently serves as Associate Director of the North American Division Ministerial Association. His role encompasses evangelism, church planting, global mission, church growth, and mission to the cities. Please welcome Pastor Jose Cortez. I'm not, all right, I think I am now. My goodness, it's not easy having to speak after Roger and Richie. So for the next few moments here, we're going to talk about Richie, great job. Thank you for reminding us of what's important. Same with Roger earlier. Let's talk for a moment about what on earth is a church here for. And I wanna start with the premise, I think We've been talking about making, thing that, making sure that things are clear and making sure that the gospel is clear. I want to just get off by saying you are saved by grace alone plus nothing, period. Amen? Amen. You are saved by grace alone through faith plus nothing, period. If you think that you're saved by anything else, I need to pray for you. And if you think that you're saved by anything other than grace alone plus nothing, period, that's not the gospel. And that's not what the Adventist church believes. Is that clear, everybody? Are we on the same page? Right. Having said that, let me go on to say that if your church is all about diet, clothing, fashion, music, or perfectionism, your church it's not the church that Jesus came to this earth to plant and to found. If when you get to church, your most important thing is, oh man, how is she dressed? How is he dressed? Oh, what kind of music are, are, are they playing today? Oh, oh, let me get up. and You know, some people actually wait for the service to begin, and then they get up and walk out to make a point. You come in dressed a little bit different than they are, and they make a point of looking at you, look at you up and down as they say, happy Sabbath. I've heard, and I know that doesn't happen in the Carolina conference, but I heard of people that actually visit their brothers and sisters from church, and they check in the fridge, you know, to see if there is any meat in it. I know it doesn't happen here. It happens in other places in North America.
If the first thing the greeter does when you come, when your visitor or your guest comes to your church is ask them if they live, live a healthy lifestyle, if they are vegetarians, that's not the church that Jesus came to plant. I don't want to say this. I'm going to be very, very clear here today. I am not saying that some of these things are not important. What I'm saying is that they are not the main thing. Is that clear, everybody? When I look at the life of Jesus, and I look at the Gospels, I see that people love Jesus, people follow Jesus. Anybody that when, when anytime Jesus showed up anywhere, people were there. And when I look at, uh, at the story of the Gospels, I see that the Bible says very little about Jesus and fashion. As a matter of fact, the Bible, I think, talks, talks one time about Jesus and dress. You know, when Jesus was dying and there were soldiers playing for his uh, robes, you know, at the feet of the cross, at the, at the foot of the cross. That's, I don't read a lot more about Jesus and, and, and dress. The Bible does not say much about Jesus and, and, and diet. We know that, that Jesus, what do, you, what do you think Jesus ate? When he went to the Passover feast. Do you think they ordered especially from the ABC in Jerusalem for, for, the AB, for, the, for, the, for the Passover feasts back in the day? <laughs> Topher? <laughs> the Bible talks about uh, Jesus and fish and the disciples. Fried fish. <laughs> I don't know if it was fried, but it was. It, was, it, it had been through the fire. I have been a vegan most of my life, but Jesus was not. I once heard someone say the reason why Jesus was not a vegetarian is because he had no access to the inspired, inspired writings of Ellen G. White. And I said to the brother, shut up. <laughs> shut up. I'm going to share a few counsels from Ellen G. White in a few moments here. So it doesn't mean that I, don't be, I, I believe in what she says. But let's take it in context and let's use it for the right reasons. Not to make people believe what we want them to believe. Music. The Bible does not say much about Jesus and music. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about, uh, you know, when Jesus was telling the parable of the prodigal son. The Bible says that, that the father and the older son were outside of the house. And as they were outside of the house, they heard what? They heard music. And what else? What else? I, I guess only one person has read the passage. They heard music. And they said, you know, the Bible says it. One time I, I didn't say it. And my wife said to me, you don't have the right to take away from the word. So stop for political uh, <laughs> Conveniences, not saying the things that the Bible says. The Bible says that as they were outside of the house, the father and the older son heard music and dancing. That must have been some dancing when you can hear dancing. I don't know how they did that. I don't, I, I'm not going to even pretend to do that in front of you. Let me just make a parenthesis here and say this. May your churches Always be filled with music and dancing because the prodigal sons and daughters keep coming back. Can someone say amen? amen. Ah. And perfectionism, I talked about it this morning. Do I believe in perfection? Yeah. The Bible says that he who began the great work in me will continue to work on me till the day of what? The coming of Jesus Christ. So on the second coming, we will all be perfect. Amen? In the meantime, we got to love people and let the Spirit work. Amen? Question. When was the last time that you told someone that you're, perf you're better than they are and they continue to like you? So if people didn't love Jesus because of his dress, if people didn't love Jesus because of his fashion, if people didn't love Jesus because of his diet, if people didn't love Jesus because of his taste of music, if people didn't love Jesus because of his perfectionism, why did people love Jesus? Hear this. 
People loved Jesus because Jesus loved people. That's it. You want to be a church that is loved? Love people. Amen? And people will love you. You want to have people outside waiting for you to start speaking so, so they can hear you? Love people. Let them know that it is a safe place. Let them know that they are safe when they come to you. Love people. People will love you back. All right. And now, what is the church here for? For God so loved the world that he gave his son, one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's Genesis, uh, John 3.16. And this is Jesus talking. In my Bible, this is in red, which means that this is Jesus talking. But now, let's go to 17. John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world. First of all, it tells you why he came. And now he's telling you why he didn't, he didn't come to do this. He came to save, to love and to save. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, this is Jesus still talking. Luke 19.10. It's in red in my Bible. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So what on earth? Are we here for a Seventh-day Adventist? What on earth is a church here for? What on earth did God, did Jesus planted when he walked this earth as, as the church began? The primary, listen up, emphasis of our church. The primary emphasis of the church that Jesus planted is to love, to seek, and to save people. And people are those who are lost. Amen. Pastor, but you're forgetting about discipleship. Listen, discipleship, discipleship. You cannot disciple someone whom you haven't saved. Amen? Amen? You need the baby to be born before you can bless the baby and help the baby to become a multiplying adult. Is that clear, everybody? So the church is here. Your church is here to love, to seek, and to save. And if these are not the priorities of your church, you need to get back in a rush and start working on this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, I like to quote uh, theologians so I can look a little bit more academic, you know, because, you know, I get my brothers and, and preachers always quoting all of these famous people and all of and you know, so once in a while I try to come over and Glenn, you know, so this is Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, all right, he's a German theologian. Uh, he gave his life for others and one time he said, the church is the church only when it exists for others. Who does your church exist for? If your church exists for you, and for your preferences, and for your likes, and for your dislikes, it is not the church. We're not here. We're not here to reach only those who dress like us. We're not here to reach only those that eat like us. We're not here to reach and to love only those that, that talk like us or that sing the same music that we sing. Or even those who sing like us. Because at times we say we love sinners, but yeah, we love everybody that sings like I do. But when I see a sinner that, 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 that sings a little bit different than I do, then that's, I cannot love that one. That, he went too far. The church is here to love, to seek, and to save people. Amen? Amen? We are not here to protect a liturgy. Amen. Pastor, we need to do the Adventist. You know, the liturgy that we've done traditionally, we didn't invent it. We need to understand that the first Adventists had been something else before they became Adventists. And they were willing to change for the sake of doing something better. Amen. So that's in our blood. It's in our DNA to change for the sake of doing something better that will bless the world. Amen. So we borrow some of those things from others. It's okay to adapt. Pastor, but LNG, I'm going to talk about LNG White in just a moment, and I'm almost done here. Ryan, I'm going to land the plane, but not yet, all right? I'm still circling. We're not here to protect the style of music. Do you know that most of the hymns in the hymnal are not, are not the, uh, written by, by Adventists? Do you know that? Do you think that the Holy Spirit died when Wayne Hooper, I think Wayne Hooper was the one who did, we've got this hope, we have this hope. 
Do you think that the Holy Spirit died at that time? The Holy Spirit is still alive today, still inspiring people to do things and to, and to author music for God's honor and God's glory. Amen? So it is okay to sing hymns of the 18th century. But it is also okay to sing hymns of the 21st century. Amen? Not everything from the 18th century is holy, and everything from the, 20, from the 21st century unholy. Is that clear? The Holy Spirit was alive then, and the Holy Spirit is still alive today. We are not here to protect the diet. It's okay to be healthy, but that's not the main reason why your church exists. We're not here to enforce a dress code. We're here, Jesus put us here, to love, to seek, and to save people. And listen, when I say save, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I said at the very beginning that the only one who saves is Jesus. We're here to share the salvation that Jesus offers. Amen? When I say save, that's what I mean, all right? I don't want anybody going out there and saying, Jose is saying that we can save. We are ambassadors of the salvation of Jesus. Quickly, let me, that's my wife. Someone went like, wow. I was like, careful there, brother. All right? <laughs> She's, she's also a pastor, and that's the reason why you don't see her with me often, because she is planting a church in Washington, D.C., right on Capitol Hill, and it's going very well. Lots of people, 80% of the people in her church had not been to church before or had not been going to church anywhere. Can someone say amen? Eight people in her church have decided that they want to be pastors, all right? And which is a great thing, you know, because we're needing more pastors in North America. But together with my wife, we had two great boys, handsome kids, all right? And my oldest one, right there, that's the oldest one. And this is the youngest one down here. I grew up in a very traditional home. I was born in the island of Cuba. And growing up, the in thing to do for young boys in my country of origin was to have longer hair. And you know, in the church, we always try to do, because we want to be good Adventists and good followers of Jesus, the opposite of what is fashionable, fashionable outside of the church. So you know, if outside of church everybody is wearing, the boys are having the hair a little bit longer, you know, inside the church we want to have it short. You know, some people like Roger Hernandez went to the extreme, you know, but, but you know what I'm talking about, short. So I remember as a little kid, you know, uh, always telling my barber, please, you know, give me a normal haircut, normal. And, but the barber didn't listen to me, he listened to my dad. And every time when I, the barber was done with me, I had my hair cut. And there was something like all the way up here. And I remember going up to, to church and the other kids at church telling me, who was the carpenter that cut, cut your hair? <laughs> One time, I remember I was trying to put my hair a little bit over my ear, trying to see if I could like stretch it enough to see if it would go over my e ear, you know, so I would look like the kids at school. And my aunt saw me doing that and she told on me, and my dad chastised me big time. I remember it to this day. He doesn't like when I tell the story because he thinks it's kind of, you know, not the right thing to do now. But back in the day, he believed deeply that I shouldn't have long hair. Today, my youngest son, he likes to wear his hair long. I always tell him, baby, you kind of look like Jesus. Ah! But now let me tell you a different story. Growing up, I never in my life put a bracelet on or a, how do you call these things, you know, a necklace, you know, a golden chain around my neck. Now I have a teenager, my oldest son, he's 18, he's in college. Look at him right there. He likes something. And he wears it. And I don't like it because I grew up without I grew up without it. Prior, and I'm being very vulnerable here. Is that okay, everybody? Are we, are we okay? A few months before he went to college, I remember waking up one day, 
Sawa. Getting ready to go to church. Get out of my bedroom. And as I'm getting out of my bedroom in Glen, Jose is getting out of his bedroom. His name is Jose Cortez III. Can you imagine? He has my name. And I looked at him. The fashion police. And I said, baby, we're going to church. And he said, yeah, Baba, I know. I'm ready. He said, baby, but I've told you that on Sabbath we wear only wear our best. Yes, Baba, I'm ready. He was wearing a T-shirt. He was wearing jeans. But he wasn't wearing the, the regular the jeans that, that we've known of for years, you know. He was wearing these jeans that are kind of like cut up all over the place with holes. I hear that they cost more money than the ones that are whole because they have to pay someone to, to cut them up. Is that true? I guess some of you are, know what I'm talking about. Sister, you wear those holy jeans? You, you, you don't? Okay, because you're smiling like you know what I'm, all right, all right, very good. Maybe the sister back there, all right, you know, all right. And sneakers. And I said, but baby, you know, he said, Papa, how much did your shirt cost? I said, well, baby, you know, my shirt is from Costco, you know, $23.99. He said, Papa, my, my T-shirt cost 40 bucks. And I'm like, ah, oh, didn't know those things cost, cost that much, David. He said, Papa, how much did your pants cost? You know, I had my nice dress pants, you know. And I said, well, baby, you know, maybe I, I don't buy anything for more than 40 bucks usually, you know. So maybe 40 bucks, baby. And, and he said, Papa, my jeans cost 80 bucks. I said, ah. And your shoes, Papa, I said, well, my shoes probably like 40 bucks, you know. It's like, you know. And my, he said, Papa, my shoes cost a lot more than that. So, Papa, this is my best. Ah! You guys are laughing. I wasn't laughing. <laughs> what do you guys think that I did? Did I take him to church or did I make him change? How many of you would have made him change? Right, one sister, all right, sister, I have a feeling you're going to be outvoted here today, but, but thanks for your honesty. I would make a change too. All right, we got two, all right, all right. If we keep making the appeal, maybe we'll get a few more, all right, two. How many of you would have taken him just like that? All right, all right. Guess what I did? I took him. Took him to church. Because... I'm not here to police fashion, even though I can give instruction. I'm not here to save jeans. Actually, I'm not here to save dress pants and a suit or a tie. I'm here to love, to seek, and to save people, including my children. Can someone say amen? Let me just make the long story short. Well, I already made it long, but I'm going to close with it. The other day he called. He was really upset. What's going on, baby? Papa, I lost my key to the car, and I really need to get to church, and I cannot get to church. When was the last time that you had a kid call you that they're upset because they cannot get to church on time? That's, that's me. He plays the piano, the keys, for the school, for chapels, for assemblies, in church every Sabbath. He plays the keys, you know. And last Sabbath he was playing at a gathering, and he said, Papa, the, the, the music wasn't all that great. Uh, and and I, I felt for a while that I should probably just quit on these people because I don't, I'm not really enjoying this. They, they, don't, they don't do their best. They don't prepare well. And I said, baby, are you sure you want to do that? And he said, no, Papa, I'm thinking that what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my friends who can play really good, and we're going to all go together so we can help them out and make it a little bit better. Ha! Ah, you know, you know, he called me. He makes $7 an hour working at the front desk in the boys' dorm, in the guys' dorm. You know, 7 bucks an hour. And he called me, you know, at the beginning of the school year. He said, Papa, how can I send my tithe to church? Help me out so I can send my tithe. That's my son. Can someone say Amen. 
I'm not here to fight over clothes or even a little bit of a necklace. I'm here as a pastor, and we're here as a church to love, to seek, and to save people, and that begins with our children. Amen? All right. We're not here to separate tares from the wheat, wheat from the tares. We're not here to judge or condemn. We're not here to keep people out. Jesus put us here to love, seek, and save people. And I'm going to close with this. This is real, and now this is real fast, okay? What about Ellen G. White, Pastor? Does Ellen G. White allow for, I, I had this, this is a whole, lot of, a whole other thing, but I'm just going to leave this. You can take photos of this. She said, let's not forget that different methods are to be employed to save different ones. All right? That's Ellen White, all right? Over here, means will be devised to reach hearts. Some of the methods used in this work, used in the past, in this work, will be different from the methods used in the work in the past, but let no one, because of this, block the way by criticism. If your church is trying to do something different, it is okay, everybody. Jesus did these things different. He was criticized, but he still did it because he did it to save us. Ellen G. White, our pioneer and founder, she says it's okay, all right? So don't let anybody use her Listen up, look, yeah, these are people using some of the old methods, all right? All right? Trying to knock on the door, that's what, all right? So <laughs> it's like keep knocking, you know? It's like someone will open up soon, all right? So <laughs> glad you're having too much fun. I thought you were sick, man. Anyway, come on. There must, be, there must be no fixed rules. Listen up. There must be no fixed rules. Our work is a progressive work, and there must be room left for methods to be improved upon, but under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, unity must and will be preserved. In other words, do not oppose a little bit of change to make things better. We're not here, we're not here to continue to implement everything that we have done in the past. We're here to seek, to love, to seek, and to save people. Look at this one, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. There are some minds which do not grow with the work. I'll start pointing fingers now. There are some minds which do not grow with the work, but allow the work to grow far beyond them. So when you have people that don't want to grow, you, you cannot stop because they don't want to grow. You must keep going because we're here to love, to seek, and to save. And every time that we're not doing that, we're doing something else that is not important. Amen? Those who do not discern and adapt themselves to the increasing demands of the work should not stand blocking the wheels and thus hindering the advancement of others. God needs men and women who will work in the simplicity of Christ. Listen up. When a precise line is laid down which the workers must follow, when only one person knows what to do and nobody else knows, only one person, that's what he's referring to here, in their efforts to proclaim the message, a limit is set to the usefulness of a great number of workers. So it's not about one person knowing everything. It's about all of us working together and trying different things different things. So everyone, when the church cannot love sinners, it is not the church and it is not of God. When the church of the message, and we are the church of the message, does not realize that the purpose of the message is not to keep the message, but to save people. The reason we have a message is for the sake of people. Amen? Amen. Remember when Jesus said, the Sabbath Jesus was talking about the Sabbath, and he said the, the, the people were not created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for people. The message is created for the sake of saving people. Amen? Amen? So when the church of the message does not realize that, it will have a very difficult time reaching people with the message. Amen? So I was like, I, I, I'm done. I'm done. We're here to save, I'm sorry, to love to seek and to save people with a wonderful message. Amen. Thank, thank you each. And uh, we weren't trying to rush you. We were just supporting you here. I'm glad. I'm glad you guys did that. Because if we, not, I would have stayed there a little longer. So we, we've got your, your back, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Roger had to uh, share something with the VLPs. Uh, at the, in the Hispanic ministry, so he's not able to be part of our, our panel here. But I uh, want to pick up on a couple of things that he said, and some of you can, can help. And let me mention the mic is there, and I'm going to ask that you limit it to questions, please. All right? Um, 
He mentioned that we need to stay, uh, stay curious. How's a good way to stay curious? You know, I think, I think the thing that he was really driving home is, is asking questions, you know, learning more. Rather than, you know, as an evangelist, you know, a good evangelist asks good questions, doesn't just have good answers or good statements. And so I, for me, it's, it's, it's getting to know someone. It's learning their story. Uh, I'll share this quick little uh, snippet. I, I, whenever I go to a community, I like to collect books. And, and I found a little bookstore there where I... Um, started going and I was going there I just got to know the book owner you know and I just got to know them I would listen to them she started telling me her story um, and I just listened you know I didn't go in there saying who I was and what I did or whatnot and uh, started telling me about her going back to church and 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 how she was raised Catholic and she was going back to her Catholic faith and I didn't come in there and say hey well you know this is the you know and tell her about the mark of the beast I just listened and, and over time, after going there a year, she finally says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. She started asking questions. I still go there. Last time I went there, she said, you know, she said, Richie, tell me the next time you're in this area preaching because I want to come and hear your sermons. I've been checking out some of your sermons online. You know, that to me is an example of being curious uh, and not coming to someone. No one wants to be a project. They want to be people. Get, be curious. All right. Thank you. Um, Jose, and I almost, I almost caught that you were passionate about this. Almost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> share, share just a little bit more on the, on the saved by grace alone plus nothing. What, what are some of the things that people put in that is the plus plus? Good behavior. Good work, Sabbath keeping, vegetarianism. I've seen it in Adventism all over the place, okay? Uh, perfection, uh, till we are able to perfect uh, our character, we won't, be, we won't be ready for him. I've heard all of those things. And those things are not biblical, and they are not Adventists. Uh, when you read the scripture in context, the gospel is that we're sinners, and we can only be saved by the work of Jesus Christ. My work cannot save me, only the work of Jesus Christ. By grace alone, what he did alone, uh, through faith, when I accept it, you know, it's like through faith, I, I, believe, I believe it, plus nothing, period. Everything else is simply a response of love. Everything else is a response of love and it's for our well-being, not for our salvation. Yes. Is that clear, everybody? So when you keep the commandments, that gives you an abundant life. You know, if you keep the Sabbath, you're, you're healthier, you know, and you have less stress. If you don't run out on your wife, brother, you know, you're most likely, uh, you'll be able to have a marriage that lasts, uh, you know, uh, for, for a long time. And you're going to have a, a good home and your kids are going to see your example and maybe they'll do the same. You get me? When you're not taking money that is not yours or something that doesn't belong to you, you won't go to jail because you're doing that. Is that clear? So all of that is not to be saved. It's just to live a longer better, more abundant life. Amen. That's Jesus. No, no, that's God telling us you can do better. You can do better. Do as I say. You know, do these things. But it's not never to be saved. Is that clear? The only one who can save us is Jesus through the death in, uh, on, on the cross of Calvary, period. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question here. Please state your name, your church, and then share your question. I'm Lorraine Perez. I'm from Fabius Spanish Church. <laughs> And I have a question about our youth that they're wearing jewelry to church and we have them actively working, but we have some people that oppose to them and they want to take them to the board so they cannot participate anymore. How can we address that in our church? Because my belief is that that could drive our youth away from Jesus' feet. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here just a bit. Um, my mother often told me the story of her family growing up. She was the last of six children. One of her older brothers went with several teenagers to a movie. I don't know if it was Saturday night, Sunday, or when. Their names, the names of all of those young people were brought to the church board. They were disfellowshipped. And my uncle never went to church again. Um, the purpose of church, the, uh, our our aim is to have our children in church learning 
they're in process. They are, they stumble like we do, but I would far rather have my children in church than, than sent away. As long as you have them with you, you can be an influence on them. The moment they are no longer with you and they don't feel safe with you, you have no influence on them whatsoever, whatsoever. So, you know what the things that I will worry about? Mental health, anxiety, suicide. Uh, those are things that are very deep and are uh, hitting our younger generations very, very strongly. Um, some of those other things, I know every time that I talk about these things, you know, you have someone that, that, that is writing and, and, you know, we're online and all of those things. And so it's hard because at times we have people who are very judgmental of the things that we say. But if it must be said for the sake of younger generations, let's say it, it's better to have them in church the way they are than not to have them in church at all. Amen? I think Jesus would do the same. Uh, Richie, uh, and I don't see any, somebody is coming to the, to the uh, mic. So please state your name and your church and your question, please. Okay, my name is Thomas Kalapurail. Um, I'm from uh, Houston area. So I'm visiting my daughter in North Carolina. So that's why I'm here. So my question to you is, uh, I know we are saved by the grace of God. But when we get our relationship, uh, love relationship with Christ, so don't we need to obey the commandments? Or in other words, at the end of time, when the mark of the beast it will be applied. At that time, if you do not keep the Sabbath, will they be in heaven? You know, it, 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 here's the thing. It's all about that personal response. So, again, obedience is a response. It's not a requirement. You know, so my, my desire to be obedient to God has to come from that experience of being saved by absolutely no works of my own. And I have to remind myself that because we, our, our very nature is that we want to prove ourselves. We want to we wanna add value to what God has done. And the reality is we just absolutely can't. If I'm in a spirit of rebellion and, and you know, because it's very different than that, than someone who's growing in Christ, who's learning, who, who's, who's but, but when I have a spirit of rebellion and I'm like, oh, I, I, you know, reject that and I don't agree with that, I'm not going to do that. And I, you know, that's, that's a different spirit. And, and so the, what we're really talking about is, is this, this stage of someone being open to God leading in their life. And I think that's the key question. Are you willing to allow God to continue to transform your life? And if their answer is yes, then they're in different stages of that process. And I think we've got to respect that. And we can't assume that just because someone's not in a certain place in that lifetime process, that they're somehow not saved. Should we keep our commandments? Of course we should. They make our life better. Are we safe by keeping the commandments? No. Uh, all of our obedience, the best that we can do as Christians, uh, when you put it before the requirements of salvation, is only filthy rags. The best that you can do, my brother, the best that I can do, the best that we can do, uh, if we follow everything and we do everything, when it comes to salvation, it's only filthy rags. Okay, the Bible says that. We're only saved by the grace of Jesus. Should we keep the commandments? Of course we should. That's what they were given so we can, but not, never to be saved, but uh, as a result of our salvation. You, you know, um, you know, but when we have a close relationship with Christ, naturally, God will empower us, right? Yes. He empower us to do it. Without his power, we will not be able to do any commandments, right? You, you know, instead of uh, rejecting that love or that relationship, if he purposely, yeah, then he will be lost. I, that is why I truly believe that. So, you know, uh, that is the breaking the, you know, commandment. But... You know, it's not, we cannot completely say that we cannot, by breaking, we will not be uh, lost. So, you know, um, when we have the relationship with Christ, Christ, uh, with his power, we will be able to do that. But if I am rejecting that, uh, empowering, then I'll be lost, I believe. Yeah. Just I'm, very, I'm very grateful, and thank you for your question and your comment. 
I'm very grateful that that scripture says that he who began the good work in you will continue the work in you. And the work will be completed by the day of the second coming. So that's, we, a, we, that's a Bible answer. We, we are going to need to, to wrap up here for our next one, but I wanted to mention something. I read it just this morning, Jose, and it was Jesus in his resurrection body, and he met with the disciples, and he says, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him fried fish with honey. Indeed. So who are we to argue with that? Some people think it was Red Snapper. Others says that, say that it was Salmon. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, we have much to grow, but we know that the purpose of Jesus Christ is that he came to save and not to condemn. And as we keep following him, he's going to guide us. He's going to convict our hearts. Amen. If our hearts are turned toward him, he's going to... He's going to lead us. And that's the key point. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's bow our heads. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, who loved the unlovely, including us. Lord, in, in our effort to see people ready to meet you, help us remember that it is you who changes their hearts. It is you who draws them. And so may, may we somehow reflect that in the way that, that we reach out, draw close to people, and let you shine through. Please, Lord, do not let us turn away anyone by our words, by our action, by our attitude. Let them see you. In Jesus' name, amen.
David Kleindienst, an international speaker, excels at simplifying intricate biblical prophecies and has shared his wisdom on four continents. His daily messages grace the screens of 3ABM Proclaim, captivating audiences worldwide. David has spoken across the United States, Africa, and Europe, engaging diverse audiences with his fervent style. Married for 25 years to Marquita, they're proud parents of two daughters. His dedication to faith and global understanding will shine through his inspirational messages. Good afternoon, Carolina, and happy Sabbath to you. Well, if we want to go ahead and grab our seats, I am excited because I actually have a whole time slot of 50 minutes or so to do this. Can you say amen? amen. I was used to the 20-minute thing, so now I actually have a chance to be able to go more in detail to something I'm very passionate about. We're going to talk about creating the culture of evangelism in the local church. But before I do that and have a word of prayer, I'm going to take two minutes since I actually have the time to do it and share with you the promotion of a resource that you will find at Advent Source after sundown. Uh, we have spent the last two or three years creating uh, a special evangelism kit and package called Forecasting Hope. You may have seen it there on the Advent Source table. This is a kit that is specifically designed to equip pastors and lay people to be able to give them everything they need to preach their own evangelistic series. In here are the newest graphics. There are 21 Christ-centered, positive, relational, evangelistic sermons, a prophecy based on Daniel and Revelation, except in a Christ-centered way. They are in PowerPoint, in Keynote. There are word-for-word -word manuscripts. And then with that, there is a written instruction guide which tells you everything you need to know of what you do each night, what needs to be handed out, what is the purpose of this particular night. It is all written out in detail uh, for the person who is presenting this and for the church who is planning this. And what makes this product unique that I'm really excited about, it also includes professionally recorded video instruction which also shares what is your focus each night, what are the things you need to do and hand out, and the part I'm most excited about, it actually has professional recorded video role plays. We have recorded actual visits with people to be able to show you how do you visit during an evangelistic meeting, what questions do you ask, how do you visit someone who is accepting Jesus? How do you visit someone who's interested in the Sabbath? How do you visit or call someone who's missed a few nights? And so we have recorded teaching clips which not only show the role play visit, but it pauses with every important question that you ask and explains why you asked that question and the direction you're trying to get that visit uh, to be going. And so there is an introductory price for it at the Advent Source table. Uh, feel free to talk to Brad Forbes afterwards uh, because this is going to be released in February throughout North America, and I'm just very, very excited about it. Can you, can you say amen? Now I want to have a word of prayer and talk about creating the culture of evangelism in the local church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've had a blessed Sabbath thus far, and we are thankful for this time of rest. But Lord, just now, we are asking you to give us ears to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, because you've placed all of us in different churches, different mission fields. And so we invite you to help us take these principles and to be able to apply them in the places where you have put each of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Creating the culture of evangelism in your local church is probably one of the most important priorities when it comes to a church experiencing revitalization. Because before I even go into the different principles, here's why this is essential. If a church doesn't have the culture of evangelism in them, if they don't have the passion for winning souls and for reaching out to others and to making a difference in the life of other people, if they don't have that passion and culture, then no form of evangelism is going to work. 
doesn't matter whether it's personal evangelism, proclamation evangelism, creative forms. If my church doesn't have the culture of evangelism in it, it is not going to work. So what I want to share with you is over the years, different things you can do in your local church, practical things that will help create a culture and a passion for soul winning. And so one of the first things we have to understand is that it is important to cast the vision for soul winning in the local church. Pastors, lay leaders, department leaders cast that vision in a number of ways. The first way is going to be through your preaching service. In other words, part of your preaching service, you need to cast the vision for mission, witnessing, and evangelism regularly. Because typically in an Adventist church, when is the time you have the most people of the church gathered together in one place? When is that? Obviously, it's usually the Sabbath morning service, whatever time that is. So you take advantage of that time by casting that vision. And that may involve someone doing a sermon series on mission and witnessing. For example, doing a sermon series on the life of Jesus and how he spent time with people that society would ignore. Others have chosen to pick a certain Sabbath every month, maybe the first Sabbath of the month, and that's when they're going to focus and preach a message on casting the vision for mission and witnessing. But it goes beyond just doing that on a Sabbath morning. You're also casting that vision in your board meetings in your committee meetings in those smaller groups. It goes beyond just Sabbath morning. It goes beyond just the board meeting. I can continue to cast that vision even in my one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And you may ask, well, why is it important to cast vision like that? Because here's the truth. A church left by itself will naturally tend to become inward-focused. If you know that's true, can you say amen? How do we know that? Because the church is made of people. And you and I are born with a fallen nature, a corrupted heart. So my heart by itself is naturally going to have a tendency to focus on who? Focus on me. And the only thing that's going to change that is when the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms my heart. It is the same with churches. If we don't cast vision for evangelism, for mission and outreach, the church will naturally tend to be inward focused. And so it's important for not just the pastor, I mean certainly the pastor included, but for the lay leaders of that church to be casting vision. That's what many of these Fortune 500 CEOs do. Now I understand the church is not a business model, but the one thing we do have in common is the job of a CEO, they cast vision to their employees, reminding them what their values are, why they exist. We are called to do the same thing when it comes to the local church if we're going to change the culture. Now you may ask the question, Pastor Dave, I don't know that my church is really interested in outreach. They tend to be inward focused and they, they don't realize where they are. And that's actually true of a lot of churches. It's true for individuals. Sometimes you and I don't recognize the things that need to change in our life until someone brings it to our attention. So when it comes to changing the culture of a church, it may require having some special meetings with your board or leadership and begin to discuss this and to ask some questions. Some questions that would first be uncomfortable questions. It may be that you need to go to the conference and ask them, could you print out a graph for us or a spreadsheet and to show us the record of growth and baptisms for my church over the last 10, maybe even 20 years? And then you set that graph before the church leaders or the church board in a kind way and invite discussion to happen about it. Because if that graph, if that record shows a steady plateau or decline, then you begin to ask the questions, do we want this to continue? 
What is it that we need to change to become a mission-centered church? Is this what we want for our children and for our grandchildren? What do we need to start looking at or doing differently? You may say, Pastor, that, that's going to be an uncomfortable meeting. You're right. In the beginning, it will. People may not say anything right away. But if you want a culture to change, it has to begin by showing a person or an institution what the status quo is because churches are not willing to change until it hurts enough. And it's the same with individuals. I am not willing to change anything in my life until I recognize the status quo, until I recognize where things are now, and it hurts enough. And so it may be just having that graph and beginning this discussion and saying and just opening it up, hey, what can we do different? Because we want something more than just plateauing or declining. You may ask each department of the church, regardless of the size, Ask them to create an evangelism plan on what this ministry and department is going to do in order to seek and to save the lost. Now, I experienced this as a pastor in the Pennsylvania Conference when I first began in ministry. The president at the time, whose name was Mike Cauley, uh, he recognized that the Pennsylvania Conference had not really significantly grown in the past number of years. We'd been around and organized as a conference for 120 years, but we had plateaued. And so he had begun a change process, and he started with us pastors, and he asked us to go back to our churches and not only to cast the vision, but to ask these first two questions about every ministry we have in our local church. Now, do you notice what the questions are? Question one, how is this activity or ministry about seeking and saving the lost? How is this activity or ministry fulfilling the gospel commission? And he asked us to honestly evaluate it. And if the answer was, this activity or ministry isn't really seeking and saving the lost, then we have two choices. One, do we really need this ministry then? Or two, what do we need to change about it so that the focus is on actually reaching outside the four walls of the church? How can we become intensely interested in the salvation of others? Can somebody say amen? Now that phrase, I didn't just make that up, that's Ellen White's phrase, where she specifically says that we are to be intensely interested in the salvation of others. Yes, the questions will be uncomfortable, but what it will do, it will begin the process of changing the culture, and that usually begins with having a discussion. Let me give you an example of how, how this may happen. In the Chesapeake Conference, where I'm the evangelism director, we began an initiative called 35 by 25. And that is the initiative to plant 35 new churches by the year 2025. You say, now how did that come about? Because really, that's a God-sized goal when you think about it. 35 new churches. And how this came about is we asked a cartographer or a map maker if he could identify for us every place in our conference that does not have an Adventist church. Show us all the unentered cities and towns that don't have an Adventist presence. So we gave him the addresses of all of our current churches, and then we gave him the parameter, and we asked, we want you to show us every place that's got a population of 50,000 people, but no Adventist church. And when the map came back to us, we were shocked. The map you see here on the screen, now it's meant to be a big, huge wall map, but do you notice that the black steeples that are there, the red steeples are existing churches. The black ones represent unentered areas. Each black one represents a place where there's 50,000 people, no Adventist church, no Adventist small group, no Adventist ministry of any kind. You, you know how many black steeples there are there? Take a guess. 
Well, not quite 100. Praise God, it's not quite 100. <laughs> there are 50 of them. That means there are 50 places in our territory that have a population of 50,000 people or an entire county without an Adventist church. And so we had to start asking the question, are we okay with this? We say we're God's last day movement. We say we're all about mission and seeking and saving the lost, yet we got 50 places with no Adventist church, and yet we say Jesus is coming soon. Are we okay with this? And we decided that we're not okay with this. And so we started casting vision to the administration. Casting the vision to our pastors, casting the vision to executive committees, and then, and then at our camp meetings. And this is what bore the plan 35 by 25. But it started by having to show this map and helping people to realize this is the current state of affairs. Are we happy with the current state of affairs? And if the answer was no, and the answer was no, then we realized we have got to do something different to make church planting and evangelism the priority in this conference. It's the same way in churches. People have to see the current status before the culture can change. If that makes sense, can you say amen? Now what I want to do is I want to use the rest of this time to give you some practical ideas of things you can do in your local church to create a culture and a passion for evangelism. And they're simple things. They're not complicated things. One of the first things you can do is have people begin to share testimonies and stories of their witnessing experiences. They say, what do you mean by that? Well, as you start casting the vision to have a culture of evangelism, As you start casting that vision to ask your members to pray to God each day to give you some opportunity to plant a seed in the heart of others, when members start praying that prayer, is God going to give them opportunities, yes or no? We already know that because the Bible says if we ask anything according to His will, we can know that we will have the things of which we ask. So is it God's will for His disciples to have opportunities to plant seeds for him. Then we know that God is going to give those opportunities. So as members begin to have those opportunities, eventually they're going to have some stories to tell. Divine providential conversations with co-workers, maybe how they took a walk with one of their neighbors and an interesting conversation came up. The experiences that happen with a classmate, when you pray for opportunities, God's going to give us opportunities. And so then what we can do is create spaces where the members of the church can start sharing those testimonies of how God is using them to reach someone for Jesus. They don't have to be elaborate, fantastic stories. They can be simple things. And so you might start by simply taking three or four minutes in your worship service and bringing a member up front and letting them share one of their testimonies of how God is using them. Now, just three or four minutes long. Now, you may have to prime them first because you don't want someone coming up and giving a you know, 15-minute sermon necessarily. But, but little, little clips like that where members can share stories. Now, at first, you may not have enough people to do that every Sabbath. That's okay. Maybe start with one Sabbath a month or two Sabbaths a month. Because as the church begins to hear different members sharing, is it going to influence them, yes or no? Okay, you didn't really enthuse me with that response there. (laughs) Is Is that going to encourage people, yes or no? It's going to inspire them. And the truth is, I don't know if there's any pastors in the house. Now, I can say this because I'm a pastor. Many times... The church will listen more to a layperson than a pastor when it comes to this. Because, you know, many people have the idea, well, you know, that's what the pastor's paid for. He or she's supposed to do that. But when you have a layperson who works 40 hours in a secular job sharing these testimonies, sometimes that can be even more powerful than what the pastor may say. And so testimonies and stories make a difference. Have time in your board meeting for someone to share a story of how God allowed their path to cross with someone. 
Share it in your committee meetings as well so that the committee meetings start to become mission-centered and mission-driven. Because that's what being a Seventh-day Adventist church is all about, amen? We are supposed to be the most mission-minded people on the face of the earth. Because we are told Jesus is coming soon and we are entrusted with a message where we are to touch people's hearts. So you can simply start by doing something like this, giving members opportunity to share. Now, if you're thinking, well, Pastor, our worship service is already long enough and you want to add three or four minutes to it, can I be blunt? Is it okay? If we don't have time, to have a section where members are sharing how God is using them to touch other people's lives, I question what the purpose of our worship service is. That should be one of the most important. That is the best way we can worship God by sharing how we are serving Him by touching the lives of others. Now, if you don't have enough people to do that every Sabbath, again, you could start with one or two Sabbaths a month and you could do something using a resource that's already available to your church. How many people here ever heard of Mission Spotlight? I mean, I hope like half of you, all of you raise your hands. Do you know every quarter, every church in the North American division is sent a DVD for the quarter with mission stories on it? Did you know that? Every church. If you say, I don't know anything about that, then ask the person who handles the mail. It is sent to every single church. And there is a mission story on there for every single week. I would encourage you to take some of these mission videos. Play them at your church. They're just three or four minute clips. And I'm not talking about doing it between Sabbath school and church when nobody's listening. I'm talking about making it part of your worship service so that it is true, it is better and more effective if your own people are sharing local stories and experiences, but it is also nice every so often to use these to show how God's Spirit is working all throughout the world field. Can you say amen? And this resource is already at your church. Now I want to talk about baptisms. Baptisms at a church or a great opportunity to cast vision and create the culture of evangelism. But you know, sometimes I've seen baptisms that are like two minutes long. You know, the person's in the water, dunk them, boom, out, done, it's over, go on with the worship service. We are really missing an opportunity here. This was impressed on me when, when I went to Cuba. I went to Cuba to hold an evangelistic series. Now, I know that sometimes people think when you go to some of these other countries that they just baptize anybody. You need to understand that's not true. It takes work to baptize people in any country of the world, amen? And particularly in Cuba, because they have the influence of communism, they don't baptize people quickly. In fact, if you do a meeting there, the people you baptize will probably be people from the previous meeting that happened before you got there. And so I remember that on the last day of the meetings, they told me there's going to be 30 baptisms on a Sabbath afternoon baptismal service. And in my North American mindset, I'm thinking, okay, you know, North America, how this might take about what? Maybe an hour and a half, two hours or so. You know how long it took? Over four hours. And you know what? Nobody left the church. <laughs> It was full the entire time. Because you know what they did? For every person that was baptized, when that person got in the tank, then the pastor told a little bit of their story and testimony. Or they allowed that individual to share a little bit of their testimony if they wanted to. They told a little bit about that person and the journey that got them here to the baptismal tank. It was inspiring. Not only that, they had someone come up and read a special Bible verse dedicated to that person. Maybe a Bible verse that the candidate requested. And then they had someone come up and sing a special song dedicated to that person. And they did that for all 30 people who were baptized, and it did not at all seem like four hours. It was exciting. It was inspiring. 
we need to use baptisms and professions of faith as a way to cast vision in our local churches. Now, in North America, we might not be able to get away with a four-hour baptismal service, but we can certainly make it special. Let the person share their story. Who cares if the worship service goes over? This is the point. Let the pastor share a little of their story if that person is a little too shy. I know some churches that actually put an insert in the bulletin with the person's picture and a little bit of their story telling something about them to introduce them to their new church family. We even have a church, uh, Ellicott City, back in, in our conference in Chesapeake. They actually record an interview with the person ahead of time, and then they show that video on the day of their baptism to communicate their story and their testimony. Because when you do that, that is not only inspiring your church, but it is casting a vision to create a culture and a passion for soul winning and evangelism in that local church. So I want to encourage you, take advantage of baptisms and professions of faith, because the truth is, at least for me, that's the best part of ministry. Because it takes a lot when a person gets to that point and you want their story to be known. Which, by the way, another thing you can do, I don't have it on the screen. If it was a lay person who gave them Bible studies, if it was a lay person who was significant in their journey to coming to Christ, let the lay person baptize them. You realize in the church manual it says that as long as you get the permission of the conference president, a lay person can baptize. Or at the very least, have the lay person in the tank helping the pastor do the baptism because that communicates something. You're casting the vision and the passion for soul winning. Does that make sense? Let's go on. Another thing that's important that a church can do, make sure that you teach training seminars on a regular basis on witnessing and soul winning. You say, well, what do you mean? I cannot ask the members of my church to do something that I have not trained them to do. I do a lot of evangelism training for pastors and lay people, not only in my own conference, but throughout North America. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you know what I've found? I want you to hear this. There are many, Many people in our churches who really want to do something for Jesus. Well, I was hoping I'd get a hallelujah on that. Many people. Now, I know we do have troublemakers in the church. I realize that. But you realize they're in the minority. It doesn't seem so because we tend to give them the most attention. But many people in our church really want to do something. And I have found that what they really want, they just want the practice, show me how to do it. I don't need the theology. Don't give me the Greek and the Hebrew. Just show me how to do it. And if you do, they will respond. So have, tra have trainings in your churches about the principles of personal evangelism. How to make friends with people. How to interject a spiritual topic in a conversation. How to visit people. How to give a Bible study. How to run a small group. How to have a car ministry. Whatever you can think of. See, Advent Source, their table out there, talk to Brad, they have so many different training resources that will train people in a church how to do all types of ministries. And see, if you train your people how to do that, once it makes sense and they catch the vision, you will have multiple missionaries in your church looking for opportunities every day to make a difference in the life of others. We do a series called Living an Evangelistic Life, which, by the way, we're doing at your camp meeting of this, this coming summer. I would encourage you to come. But this is a series. We take six sessions, and we train people in the practical parts of every aspect of ministry, from Bible studies to visitation to how to help someone make a decision for Jesus. When you equip your people and they catch the vision, they will do it. Hallelujah. Make sure, whether it's quarterly or monthly, you have different training sessions for your members. Listen, if you just had a handful of members to start with that were trained and equipped and on fire for Jesus, would that be worth the time, yes or no? 
that would change a church. Let me share with you some other things. Get the church involved in community service projects. Now, that, this may sound strange to hear an evangelist say this, because a lot of times we have this argument in the church that, to be honest, just drives me crazy. And people say, what's better, personal evangelism or proclamation evangelism? And there will be people who say, no, it's personal evangelism, public evangelism, outdated, irrelevant, it doesn't work anymore. Which, by the way, I have to tell you is absolutely not true. I, I, sometimes I think that we let something be repeated in the church so much that we actually believe it. Now, I'll tell you a story a little bit later. But on the other hand, you have people who say, no, public evangelism, but I'm not going to be involved in personal evangelism or do any preparation. Why does it have to be an either-or conversation? It should be a both-and. They work together. So when you get a church involved in community service projects or in bridge events to your community, whether it's a health seminar, financial seminar, depression, or a block party, or a golf club for men, or being as creative as you can think, you say, what's the purpose of this? Am I going to get a, are you going to have a Bible study in a community service project? Is this going to result in a baptism? These ministries aren't for the purpose of reaping. These ministries are for the purpose of relationship building. Because here's the truth. I should have put this on a slide. If you forget anything I say today, I want to invite you to hear this. Relationship building is the biggest part of soul winning. You will never win someone to Jesus who doesn't trust you first. And the only way trust can be developed is if I spend time with people and become their friend. And so these community service type ministries are for the purpose of building trust and building relationship so that when I go farther down in my evangelism cycle and the church has more intentional spiritually oriented events, like a revival or an evangelistic series, these are people who've already learned to trust me because I have a relationship with them and we've done some community service type ministries together. Does that make sense? Plus, if you want to create the culture of evangelism, I have to help my church learn how to develop relationships with people who are not Seventh-day Adventists. I have to help them learn to mingle with people who don't know Jesus. People who are outside the walls of the church because that's who God has called us to reach. We can't be an inward-focused church and say that we have the culture of evangelism. Get involved in relationship-building ministries. Now, something I used to do when I was pastoring, I pastored a, uh, a, a three-church district of smaller churches. And they were all different from each other, believe me. <laughs> and I remember in, in one of the churches, or not, not one of them, in all of them, one of the simple things we did was this. We would get a box of books from the ABC, a box of sharing books, or you can get a box of DVDs, something that's appropriate to share. And we would get a box of 100, sit it up front before the church, and I would challenge them and say, here's your goal, Here, here's your mission. This quarter... I'm inviting you to find one person that you can give this book to in a personal conversation. Ask God who it is that you think he thinks you should give this book to and this quarter find one person. Or you could do one, once a month. Now you might be thinking, once a quarter? I could give out 10 books a week. <laughs> this activity isn't for people who are already doing that. This activity is for the people who are normally on the sidelines and not involved and they don't do things like that. So if you tell them, man, you got to do one book a day, you're going to freak them out. You tell them, look, once a quarter or maybe once a month, then they think, oh, okay, maybe I can do that. And see, the caveat is this has to be in the context of a personal relationship. They can't take the book or the DVD or whatever the resource is and just go and leave it in a public bathroom or just go and leave it in a laundromat somewhere or go to Walmart and stick it underneath the windshield wipers. 
Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. People have come to Christ through those things. But in this exercise, the context is in a personal relationship or connection of some sort. And if you do this, and let's say that even 20% of the people who are normally on the sidelines actually get involved in this, would that be worth it, yes or no? It absolutely would. And you know what? It doesn't cost all that much but a box of 100 resources or, or whatever the size of your church is. Listen, when you do a reaping series, you're going to spend a good bit of money, and you should. So is it worth it to spend even 100, 200 bucks for a box of resources that is going to get your church and some of your members involved in outreach on a personal basis, would that be worth it? That was kind of a weak amen. <laughs> would that be worth it? I, I would think so. And you can customize it in a way that works for your church. Now, I'm going to share with you a story that was a hard, hard lesson for me. If I'm a leader in a church, whether it's pastoral or lay leader, I'm going to have to inspire others by getting personally involved in mission myself outside of what I'm paid to do in the church. You see, I cannot cast vision by asking people to do something that I'm not doing myself or that I'm not modeling for myself. That's true whether I'm a pastor or a lay leader in the church. I, I remember it was about a few years ago pre-COVID I came home from the conference office one day, and as I walked up to the door of my house, there was a little Christmas gift sitting there. This was around Christmas time. There was a little gift, a little gift bag there from one of the neighbors. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what that is. And so I grabbed it, and I went in the house. I opened it up, and here it was like a can of homemade jam or jelly or something with a nice little Christmas card in it. And I could tell by what they had wrote on the Christmas card that they were probably Christians, that they were spiritually oriented. You know, here's a wonderful gift. May God bless you at this time, at this time of the year. How do you think I felt when I received that from my neighbor? Actually, I was ticked off. I was upset. You know why I was upset? Yeah, because I was thinking to myself, why, why wasn't I the one that did this? Why weren't we the ones going to our neighbors whose names I didn't even really know, a lot of them, and giving them little gifts? It actually irritated me because I was feeling convicted. And what bugged me even more is I'm thinking to myself, okay, here you are giving seminars around North America about how to be a witness for Jesus, and you got your neighbors bringing you stuff, and you're not. So I, I felt really bad. And it impressed on my heart the importance that I can't just rely on what I do in the conference office, so to speak. I've got to be personally involved in mission outside the church as well, whether I'm a pastor or a lay leader. Does that make sense? You know, it's so good to actually have more than 20 minutes. I just love this. Ah, this one. This is more a mindset. Don't be a negative, self-fulfilling prophecy. You say, well, what do you mean by that? What you believe about your church is exactly what you're going to get. What you believe about whether your community or your mission field is open to Jesus is exactly what you're going to get. Let, let me give you a couple examples. I remember when I went to St. Louis to be the resident evangelist. Now, that may be a term that's a little different for you. Uh, a resident evangelist is someone who lives in a large urban area full time, and they work with the churches in that area in helping them develop a cycle of evangelism and having reaping series with them. It's actually one of my best times in ministry. I loved it because you don't have to pick up and go somewhere different every six weeks because there's enough work in many of our multi-million population urban cities. And so I remember when I first got there, I just needed, first of all, to go to the churches and get to know them and build relationships. So I remember in one of the churches that I'm not going to name right now, <laughs> the pastor couldn't be there for a prayer meeting. And so I agreed to do it for him and to teach a training seminar. 
So I got there early to set my computer up because I, I don't like messing with equipment when there's a bunch of people watching you. And so I got there early. And I remember a, a, a lady came through the door, a member of the church, recognized that I'm not her pastor, and so she says to me, who are you? Not welcome, but who are you? And so I explained that I'm the, I'm the resident evangelist that just came to St. Louis, and I'll be working and helping the churches in their reaping events. And you know what she said to me? She said, oh, well, good luck to you. Now, I took that in two ways. Number one, she said, good luck to who? You. So I took that to mean good luck to me because she's not planning on helping me. <laughs> the other thing she said was good, what? Luck to you. You know what I heard for that first year I was in St. Louis? All I ever heard, how hard St. Louis is. Oh, this area is too secular. Oh, this area is too Catholic. You know, St. Louis. Oh, public meetings don't work here. Oh, you can't visit people in their homes in the city anymore. That is all I ever heard. But you know what I discovered after seven years? None of that was true. Public meetings did work in St. Louis. You could visit people in their homes, and they welcomed you once you had a relationship with them. Sometimes we believe these things that aren't even true. And so if I'm going to believe that there's nobody in my mission field that's going to respond to Jesus, that's exactly what you're going to get. And that negative attitude is going to be communicated to your church. I believe Joe Kidder from, from Andrew's Seminary, I believe he wrote in his book, the, the Big Four or the Big Five, he shared a study that was done, a church growth study, where they studied churches in the same city both growing churches and declining churches. And they purposely did it in the same city, in the same area, so that the contexts would be equal. And they asked each church, first they asked the declining churches, the ones that weren't growing, they said, tell me about your mission field, how are people responding, are you excited? And you know what their responses were? People just aren't interested like they were today. People don't respond anymore, it's hard. Our community is too secular. Our community is too postmodern, and I hate that word because I think we use it as an excuse sometimes. But our community is too postmodern, and you know what? The churches that were declining had a negative attitude towards mission and towards people being open to Jesus, and they became a self fulfilling prophecy. The churches that were growing, when they were asked the same question, their answer was oh, it's exciting. Our community is interested in Jesus. We, we had this person who was transformed. They had a story of this person. And they were excited about what the future held. And their positive attitude became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Does that make sense? And I take Jesus as an example here. In Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Now, normally we focus on the part that says the laborers are few. I actually want to focus on the other part. He said the harvest is what? Great? In his context? In his day, where the majority of the institutionalized Jewish church rejected him? Where the religious leaders wanted nothing to do with him? Where they dogged his every step like the paparazzi just trying to find some little thing they could take out of context to ruin his reputation. That's the harvest field that is great. After three and a half years, he has 12 disciples and 120 people in an upper room, which by human standards would be considered a failure. In a context where they nailed him to a cross. Now, if there was any mission context that was hard, it would have been where Jesus was. But yet Jesus said the harvest is what? Great. And I often wondered, how could he say that? The answer is in the first two verses. Now I'm going from a workshop to preaching. I've got to be careful. In verses 35 to 36, you know what it says? That Jesus had compassion on them as people having, as sheep without a shepherd. And that he went and mingled with them in their homes. 
He ate with them in the marketplace. He sat down with them in small groups by the seashore. You know why Jesus knew the harvest was great? Because he was out with the harvest. He was out mingling with people. And when you do that, you begin to see there are people who are open to Jesus. There are people who are wanting something better. But if all I'm going to do is preach to people from a distance without stepping down from my pulpit and getting personally involved in their life, then no, I'm not going to see that the harvest is great. But when I'm with people, I see how the Holy Spirit is working. And that's when I can say, yes, it may not be easy, but the harvest truly is great. When I have a positive attitude and I am out mingling with people because then I see the needs. If that makes sense, can you say amen? amen. All right, a few other things before we wrap up here. It is, it is so cool to actually have till 5 o'clock. If I were to ask you to tell me what is an interest list, what would you say? What would you say the definition of an interest list is? Yeah, an interest list is basically all the names of anybody who has had contact with your church. They came to a health seminar. They came, brought their kid to a VBS. May, maybe one of your people were given Bible studies to them. Uh, maybe, maybe they came to some um, depression seminar. Maybe you had a block party and they came. All those names go on an interest list if they've had some contact with your church or the person in your church. Because that interest list, is then what you're going to use to keep developing relationships with them. Inviting them to other events, maybe having a monthly email newsletter that goes out to them if you have their, their email address. And when you do different events, and especially an evangelistic series, they're actually going to be your focus. Because who's going to be more likely to come? The person on your list who's already had some positive interaction with you or the person who gets a flyer in the mail but doesn't know you from a man on the moon. It's going to be the person on your interest list because of the relationship. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying we shouldn't send out flyers. We absolutely should send out flyers. We're not at the point in North America where we can't do that. And in some, many of our big cities that have over a million people, unless you're going to knock on a million doors, you still need flyers along with the personal relationships. What we're saying is the personal relationships are more effective, but those flyers are still going to go to someone that maybe we don't know who right now God is working with and their heart is open. But I go so far as to tell our churches in Chesapeake, I hope this doesn't seem too harsh, but I tell them, listen, a church that doesn't have an interest list is not a church that's interested in soul winning. I, I don't care what they say verbally. Because if you don't have an interest list, I know you're not following up with those people because you don't have contact information. And so it does take effort to have an active interest. In fact, when we give out evangelism subsidies in Chesapeake, we tend to favor those churches who actually keep and have an active interest list. Because if you've got a membership of like 300 people and, and there's five people on your interest list, there's something wrong with that. Go through the effort of having a viable interest list. You can also utilize prayer meeting to pray for interests. Now, there's a novel idea. I believe it was Ellen White who encouraged us to get together in small companies and pray for the salvation of others. Now, how many of you were here? I forget when it was now. It was yesterday afternoon when I told the story of the Westminster Church. How many were here for that? Okay, most hands are not up. I will briefly repeat that. The Westminster Church is a, a mid-sized church in Chesapeake, Westminster, Maryland. Just maybe 80 people in attendance, uh, you know, 100 and some people on the book. Just your average church. They were at a point where they were ready to close their doors a few years ago before COVID. But then they had a pa the, the conference decided to call a pastor who had a passion for evangelism and developing an evangelism cycle. And he got this church so excited about mission, the elders, the leaders bought into it, that within a two-year period, that church had the most baptisms of any English church in the entire conference, including our large multi-pastor churches that got like a 1,000 membership. They had more baptisms than they did. Because... 
they followed a cycle of evangelism. And one of the things they did is they actually developed prayer groups where they prayed for the people who were on their interest list. In every board meeting, they listed the people who they're working with that were close to decisions, and they talked about them, and they prayed for them. Because as much as I, as Richie and others, may love evangelism, we recognize that our skill isn't going to change anybody's heart. It's only the Holy Spirit. Pray. Have intentional prayer ministries for the people that you're reaching out to. And then I think lastly, almost next to last, I need to share this. You may be thinking, well, Pastor Dave, you, you don't know my church. You don't know the challenges. The relationships are negative. You might even call it toxic. I, I can't get my church interested in soul winning. It's been inward focused for years. It, it almost seems hopeless. I understand. I had a church like that. Not going to mention the name because I'm on a live stream. <laughs> but it was a church that they didn't like me. The, the head elder did not like me. Not exactly sure why to this day. He made it clear. He would talk about me and make snide remarks both personally to my face and then other times and other people were around. And it was a difficult church. So much so that it got me to the point where I questioned my call to ministry. I even went to the ministerial director and I said, please, please move me somewhere else. I don't care if it's Timbuktu, just put me somewhere else. And he wouldn't move me. It really ticked me off at that time. But I'm glad he made me stay. Because it came to a point, I remember we went, my wife and I went to a prayer conference in Modesto, California at that time. And it was at that prayer conference, Jose Rojas was speaking. And they had, they had broken everyone up into small groups. And so we shared with our small group what was going on in our life. That we were new in ministry, we were discouraged, we were questioning our call, we were thinking of quitting, we didn't know what to do with this church. You know what that group did for us? And they prayed for us. And it was over Valentine's Day. You know what that group did? They took up a collection among themselves. And on Valentine's Day, they said, look, we'll give you permission. You can skip the evening meeting. Go out and have a Valentine's meal with your wife. <laughs> I still get emotional about it. <laughs> Th those people have no idea what they did for a young couple in ministry. And I remember when we flew back home that Sunday night, I was supposed to do a training session in my church on mission. You know how many people showed up? Zero. And so my wife and I decided, you know what? We're going to find one person in this church who understands what's going on. One person who understands that there needs to be a culture changer, and we're going to ask them, would you get together with us, even if it's once a week, and would you pray for culture change? And we found that one person. We still know her to this day. I can't say the name because then you know, some would know which church it is. And she prayed with us. And you know what we saw God do? It didn't happen right away. We saw him begin to change things. Change things to the point that when I did get a call to go somewhere else, I actually turned it down. The church that I couldn't wait to get away from, I actually turned it down. Because it also came to the point that while you're praying for culture change, I also had to be willing to say, Lord, will you change me too? Because it can't be all their fault. Will you change me too? And when we started praying that prayer, that's when God began to work in us. So if you sense that maybe you're in a ho hopeless situation, I want you to know that no situation is hopeless. Because my God says that what is, in, what is impossible for man, that all things are possible for God. And you find that one person that prayer partner that you can get together and pray with, and over time in your persistence, watch and see what God will do, because sometimes that is where we have to begin. And then last but not least, hold regular public evangelistic meetings in your church. Because studies have shown in the Adventist church 
the vast majority of growing churches have proclamation evangelism as part of their evangelistic plan. It's not the only thing they do, but it is part of what they do. And find a way to make that, I could do a whole seminar on this part, but I can't. Find a way to make them relational, to make the topics Christ-centered, to have ways where you visit people and connect with them. Because I'm convinced that there are two main reasons why churches don't always have the results they want from proclamation evangelism. Two main reasons. Number one, they don't have an evangelism cycle where they have prepared and built relationships with people. And number two, they're not visiting people during the meetings. They're just standing from the pulpit and preaching and thinking that that's going to do it. Please understand, conviction does not happen from the preaching. I'm sorry, let me take that back. Decisions don't come from the preaching. Conviction may come from the preaching, absolutely. But the decisions usually come when I sit down with someone one-on-one -on -one in a personal context and they're able to share their challenges, to share what they're struggling with, and we pray together and we talk together. That's where the decisions come from. The conviction from the preaching, yes, we need the preaching but the decisions usually come from one-on-one -on -one sitting down with people. That's a different seminar. But hold regular public evangelistic meetings. Can you say amen? I mean, I know Richie's going to say amen. That's important. And so, friends, my, my prayer for you is that as you implement some of these principles, and many of them are just so simple, that you will see God work. And through prayer and through intentionality, you will begin to create a culture and a passion for evangelism and soul winning in your local church. And you will see many who are one to the kingdom of God and whose lives are changed by Jesus. God bless you, my friends.